Well, uh, I will talk about the platonic path as a reversed repetition. I'll try to explain what I mean with a reversed repetition. Well, if we apply the platonic construction of the concept as the thing itself to Plato's text, and if, if we consider Plato's writing as a writing, we would be puzzled by its performance as a narrative foundation of the anti-narrative space of the episteme. Such puzzlement results from the trespassing of epistemic boundaries, which the Platonic text appears to ground, but which were to appear only later on. In order to deal with the seeming conundrum, we may want to play with Deleuzean language, and we may say that Plato's writings inaugurate a process of becoming Plato, which has not yet subsided. More precisely, just like Charles Péguy described the fall of the Bastille as the Zeroyan, uh, the zeroth or zero degree commemoration of the French Republic, we may read the very content of Platonic dialogues as the zero degree of the Platonist re-reading of Plato. Peggy's use of repetition is thoroughly counterintuitive because it constructs past occurrences as iterating subsequent ones. Nevertheless, such anachronistic repetition, by virtue of its apparent incongruity, can remind us of our constant intervention upon the past. In this presentation, I will apply the theoretical device of Peggy's anachronistic repetition to the Platonic text in order to reconsider the Platonic path. In particular, I will first retrospect retrospectively describe such path as a decisive step in Greek thought's move from the Republic of Stories to the realm of concepts. Second, I will suggest a topological reversal of this move, both as a recovery of the networks of stories and as pluralization of concepts. Third, I will construct the Platonic path as a reversed repetition of the long 60s participative practices of co-individuation and their contemporary retentional wow, uh, deposit as interactive media, which present us with a pharmacological opportunity to transform the very constitution of human subjects. In his famously controversial seventh letter, Plato explicitly declares the political task that motivates his proposal of a new paideia, a word that can be roughly translated as education. Because the traditional paideia seems to be unable to grant a fair and stable political condition for Athens and the Greek cities in general, Plato emphasizes the need for, I'm quoting, some extraordinary reform with good luck to support it, end of quote. His new conceptual framework, which sets apart ideal models from their individual copies and consequently severs episteme, or knowledge, from doxa, or opinion, is supposed to ground such an extraordinary reform. Within the Platonic project, the construction of the epistemic perspective is aimed at the realization of the good in the city. As a consequence, Plato does not question traditional narration's truthfulness, but rather their educational content, which he deems as often poor, contradictory, and sometimes even counter counterproductive. This is why he can also adopt within his dialogues the narrative register or so-called mythological stories, whose mimetic power he brilliantly exploits to better illustrate his views. 
in order to rely on the representative power of mimesis or imitation without being constrained within the limits of tradition, traditional paideia, traditional education, Plato deploys a subtle rhetorical strategy. He considers the current uses of the word mimesis as specific and limited instances of a more general and meaningful mimesis. This strategy is clearly at work in his dialogue symposium, where the priestess Diotima applies it to the word poiesis, which can be translated both as poetry and as producing in general, and to the word, word eros, or love, in sexual desire. Diotima plays on the multiple uses of the word poiesis to argue that the derived noun poietai, which defines the poets, gives to a part of the producers, namely those who deal with rhythm and verses, the poets, the name of the whole. In a similar way, Diotima celebrates Eros as sexual desire for a bodily beauty in as much as this desire is a limited occurrence of a higher and more complete desire for a non-perishable beauty, namely the beauty of Eide or ideal forms. Just like sexual eros, the mimetic embodiment of a character of a story is turned by Plato into a lesser occurrence of a more general relation between individuals and forms. Hence, where the forms are the models, mimesis produces eikota, or good copies. Otherwise, Plato has phantasmata, or in Latin simulacra, that is, bad copies. I would here suggest constructing Plato's quest for a new paideia as an effort to theorize and promote new processes of co-individuation. Following my appropriation of Peggy, this would mean making Plato repeat Simondon in affirming the necessity, I'm quoting, of the co-presence with some other being so that individuation as the principle and context of meaning could appear. End of quote. Of course, Plato can only imperfectly repeat Simondon, inasmuch as he conceives of his new paideia as a rediscovery, albeit co produced, of an array already there. On the contrary, we may make Aquinas adapt Aristotle's cyclical framework to the Christian linear progression in a similar way to Simondon who opens up an aximander circulation of individuation and de-individuation towards an open multiphasic process. However, Simon Don, too, looks back to an aximander aperon, or the non-determined, as the pre-individual absolute origin. Uh, the famous Anaximander fragment reached us as a Simplicius quotation of Theophrastus, uh, who was Aristotle's pupil and successor as the head of the Peripatos. We may reasonably doubt whether the fragment is a literal rendering of Anaximander or a periphrasis. In particular, Havelock suggests the possibility that Theophrastus, following his master's systematizing approach, could have turned the adjective aperos into the substantivated neuter form aperon, which would better fit Aristotle's construction of previous thinkers as mainly concerned with the definition of archai, or principles. However, Regardless if either Anaximander himself or Theophrastus operated such a linguistic and theoretical turn from Aperos to Aperon, the word Aperon bears witness of a more general transformation which began after the composition of the Homeric poems and was abruptly brought to an end by the Aristotelian metaphysical archaeology of the present. On the linguistic side, this long process entailed the construction of a specific written language, 
which turned oral poetic narrations of sequences of actions rendered with, with verbs into a written text ordered around the theme of an inquiry upon reality, which was mostly described with nouns. On the theoretical side, the linguistic derivation of <coughs> nouns from verbs was reversed into the logical and ontological priority of the recently invented abstract generalization, which we now call concepts, over their supposed instantiations. In the course of this process, those whom we now call philosophers shifted the Greek appropriation of traditional culture via sensory motor identification with the characters of the stories towards the reification of these characters as objects of knowledge. In other words, instead of relating to the hero Achilles as a living character through empathic embodiment, they constructed the practice of thinking about Achilles as a known object. As previously recalled, in Plato's dialogues, such a turn is still in progress, Pasha Nietzsche. In particular, erotic involvement with both subjects and objects is not yet discarded, but is given a vicarious or decentered role. Ironically, in Platonic terms, we may read this decentered embodiment as the echoes or the genuine copy of the fading tragic. Just one generation later, this embodied sense of tragic is just a source of embarrassment for Aristotle, who has to recur to the function of catharsis or purification through dramatic enactment in order to rationalize the still participative fruition of Greek theatrical audience. Apparently, Plato himself gave Aristotle the nickname or an agnostis, or the reader. We may be tempted to deduce from this definition that written texts had not yet assumed a privileged role, even in 4th century BC Greek intellectual circles. Nevertheless, at that time, writing was an extremely powerful emerging technology whose effects already raised concern. For example, in his seventh letter, Plato warns about the danger of committing relevant knowledge to writing. To writing. He expresses the same cautious stance in the dialogue Phaedros or Phaedrus, where his dramatis persona Socrates restricts the usefulness of writing to the function of hypomnesis or rememoration as opposed to mneme, that is, the recollection of ideal forms. However, writing was already producing its prosthetic effects. In the same dialogue, learning is described with the, with the metaphor of writing on the soul. In the Phaedrus, Socrates narrates the Egyptian invention of writing which he defines as a pharmacon, or medicine. As Derrida notoriously underscores, the word pharmacon can also be translated as poison. It may be argued that the auto-ontonymity of the word pharmacon is a residual instance of a more general semantic polyvalence, which was first forced underground in the course of the construction of Greek written language. It may be also claimed that such polyvalence, such semantic polyvalence of words, was made again to disappear by the second main orthopedic intervention on Western language, which began in the 17th century and had to wait Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations to be exposed. Uh, within the conceptual framework, sorry. My text is resisting. Within the conceptual framework constructed by the Greeks and re-enacted by the moderns, ambiguity 
could be either neut neutralized within series of binary positions or acknowledged in operatic terms. We may make play to repeat not only both strategies, but also more than that. It is possible to read, prima facie, this platonic excess in regard to the conceptual sphere as a persistence of the tragic. Such a reading could be supported also by the various evidence of the yet made a stable condition of contemporary stories in the way of truthification, such as, for example, oh, shifting text. Sorry. The clinical descriptions of the corpus Hippo Hippocraticum, or to see these things as they happened, or Anaxagoras dissection. Moreover, this very reading would be pretty much in line with the Western tradition of explaining change rather than continuing. However, both the dichotomy of change versus continuity and the latter's logical and ontological priority were produced as theoretical processes during the move from stories to concepts, which involved, in Stigler's terms, a shift from explicitation to expli explication. I contend that the reactivation of the tragic is being already produced as an inversion of this shift, which could be better conceived of as a topological reversal rather than a logical one. In particular, whilst explication was devised as a convenient and powerful shortcut in order to support a monologic view, it could, at last, appear as a dangerous bottleneck in the dialogical perspective of participative co-individuation. Uh, the practices of participative co-individuation that occurred since the long 60s are yet to be fully theorized. However, I contend that these practices allowed us to understand Nietzsche's construction of the tragic as the previous phase of Western individuation. If this holds true, the platonic excess would be better construed not as the residual of the tragic, but as a reversed repetition, a way out, mirroring a way in, of our attempts to pluralize concepts and to recover the networks of stories. Whilst these attempts mainly occurred during the long 60s, they seem to have crystallized as a kind of tertiary retention in the new communication technologies. We may understand these technologies as a deridian pharmacological opportunity which may even be pushed further as the constitution of a new pre-individual apeiron. Playing with verbal resonances, we may say that by considering a new pre-individual apeiron, Stigler moves from multiple aporiae or, or aporias to multiple apeira or non-determined entities. In turn, my suggested forward-looking forward repetition would not only imply the pluralization of the pre-individual apeiron, but also the reconsideration of Simondon's disparation, which would be thought as the result of individuation. In other words, disparation would be construed as a problem only by its solution, which would not only inform the pre-individual field, but would also produce it as a specific, not yet formed something. In this case, apia would have to reverse their previous course from adjectives to nouns in order to take account of their determined determined rather than determining role. Such a topological reversal of the path leading to Theophrastus and Aximander would be an instance 
of a more general reversal of the path leading to the question about how things stand, which shaped post-Platonic Western thought as a series of ontological, theological, and naturalistic answers. Western thinkers could conceive of how things stand only in as much as an episteme was presupposed. On the contrary, if the tragic is reactivated by pluralizing concepts and recovering the networks of stories, the processes of validation of knowledge could be, at the same time, processes of participative co-individuation. These processes would include ongoing negotiated assessments of the cost of any thereness, or if you prefer, objectivity, be it the out thereness of synchronic or scientific objectivity, or the already thereness of historical or genealogical reconstructions. For example, we might want to inscribe the prosthetic already thereness of tertiary retentions within a discursive frame which could be validated by its ability to establish connections with other discourses. In particular, the political, social, economic, and cultural re resonances of a pharmacological approach to new interactive media could produce the validation of a general pharmacology or organology, which in turn could help reframing political, social, economic, and the broader cultural discourses. The ambivalence of pharmaca is already the result of the overriding of semantic polyvalence by binary oppositions. I contend that we can reopen the dichotomic straitjacket by rewriting and retelling the stories of the West. Such a recomposition should not be limited to so-called turning points, whose repetition should be problematized rather than simply taken for granted. In this perspective, the synchronic coexistence of analogical relations and stories with conceptual frameworks, frameworks should not be understood as a resistance to grammatization, but rather as parallel paths which eschewed the conceptual ones. For example, Roman law did not produce rights as derivative from an abstract model of law, but it dealt with specific cases by analogically stretching reference procedures. Another example could be the plurivocity of Western painted stories, which on the one side continued expanding the multiverse of Greek and Judaic narrations beyond the theological conceptualization of Christianities, and which on the other side were able to negotiate the, their semantization with the specificity of the languages of forms. Uh, as I made a plea for the recovery of Greek stories, I probably should be worried now about the impending catastrophe that will follow my act of hubris or extreme arrogance uh, that is my proposed reading of Plato in neither a Platonic nor a Platonist way. And yet, maybe things could be otherwise because they have already been otherwise. Thank you.